Mr. Harley, uh, do you remember a moment in which you decided to become a filmmaker? I remember the period of time. Uh, I was at art school in uh, Massachusetts, in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, I took a, a course in Super 8 filmmaking. Uh, and I just remember the magic of capturing an image. And back then you had to wait for two weeks to get that image back from the lab. Um, and there was just something that really, you know, I'd spent most of my uh, childhood and early adolescence drawing a lot and painting. I was always very visual. But it had never occurred to me to make pictures that moved, to make motion pictures. And, um, and so that's really, it took about six months, but then I really got infected by this desire to make moving pictures. Uh, can you name any filmmakers or any films that uh, helped you to get well, to Well, uh, back then, this was like 1978, uh, in Boston, uh, that film course was, uh, well, it was at an art school, so the, the films tended to be real art films. I mean, Stan Brackage, which often is not even motion pictures, technically, he draws on films and stuff. Um, but I remember being very moved by Maya Deren's work and Peter Hutton, uh, even films by Joseph Cornell, who used found footage. And I started making Super 8 movies of really little things, mostly, you know, what was in my room, what was on my street. And uh, it didn't take long before I started organizing these into stories. I wasn't, at the beginning, I didn't even think of stories, but before long, uh, I was telling stories. And my teachers had to point that out to me. They even pointed out to me that my, my drawings were very narrative that they told stories. Uh, was it clear for you, uh, for you from the very beginning that you would be making only independent films? No, I've never, I never thought about independence or, or the opposite of independence. I just made the films I wanted to make. And I always did that. And then by the time the early 90s came along, there was this thing called independent American cinema. And before I knew it, people were telling me that I was, you know, a representative independent American filmmaker, you know, and it helped, you know, it helped people put what I was doing in a category, uh, I think, uh, because I was definitely, it seemed, I had a hard time getting people to watch my films and understand how to appreciate them, uh, because they seemed to be outside of a category, but once somebody invented this independent American category, uh, it was okay. <laughs> so I appreciated it. But uh, as you have just said, uh, you, you have already become like a reference for new filmmakers. How do you feel about that? Um, um, I'm happy oh, sorry, if it... Sorry, influence. Mm. No, if I could be a reference or an influence, yeah. That's great if it's a good thing. I mean, it was helpful for me when I was younger to have examples of types of films that, uh, you know, older people uh, had made that kind of pointed in a direction. For me, it was like Werner Herzog uh, was a big uh, influence right at the beginning, uh, Terence Malick. Uh, and later on, more, the new German cinema was a big influence for me you know, by the time I got to film school, so in my early 20s. Um, when, do you, uh, when you're about to start shooting a new project, do you tend to look back to do what you have already done? Um, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, sometimes, I think this is the same with any kind of, any kind of artist, is that sometimes it's necessary to just l turn around and look at what's in your studio, just look at what you've done. Uh, sometimes it gives you courage 
when you don't know how to move forward uh, because it's part of the the day-to-day -day work of a creative person is that you're um, which is different than a craftsman if I were simply a craftsman I would know what I was doing I'd get up in the morning and I'd I'd craft the thing that people are expecting me to craft but uh, art is different and you, you're constantly investigating and trying new things out and you're trying to find a way forward that's right for you at that time and so there's a certain amount of anxiety all the time and uh, so sometimes it's important to look back on some of your films to, just to see like well I solved that problem you know 15 years ago that way uh, and it's it's hard to put into words, but it, it just gives you a, like a little punch in the arm, pushes you forward. Uh, some filmmakers consider every single uh, one of their films like a child of their own. Uh, is that the same for you? Um, yeah, I I don't use that kind of language about it, children, but I understand where it comes from. I think Fellini said that first. Uh, because you spend a lot of time with any film. Uh, it's usually like two years at least that you spend. And you have to make so many really heavy decisions. Uh, everything's uh, very important. So it really brands, burns right into you a little bit. Uh, when do you when you decide that you want to move film a new project? Um, how do you start looking for the production money? Well, um, I usually go to the distributors who have distributed my films in the past, and if they've um, been successful with some of my films. I show them the script. Uh, now, I used to do that more in the 90s. Uh, it's a little bit different now. Uh, films aren't uh, on the level that I make films in the, say, the two to five million dollar range. Uh, that doesn't happen that much anymore. Um, you need to go to a world sales agent and uh, try to get them invest, you know, to invest uh, based on what they think they can make from the rest of the world. So it's all these stuff like that. For me, every single film I've made has been financed in a different method. Um, there's attendance in your films a lot uh, working with the same actors in different projects. Uh, okay. well, um, well, that tends to happen uh, earlier in a person's career, as it did in mine. But it's really no different than, say, Scorsese's career. You know, the the men and women who were acting with uh, Scorsese in his earlier films tended to stick you know, uh, because they, I would assume it's similar to my situation, they, they understood what I was doing and uh, I understood that they could hear me <laughs> when I was talking to them. And also uh, for me, uh, I learned a lot about how to work with actors from these actors in my early years. But then as uh, we go on, you know, it's been 20 years now that I've been making films, um, it's less so. Uh, have you ever been offered to direct a main, main, mainstream project? Have I, uh, pardon me? Have, have you ever, sorry, have, uh, have you ever been offered to direct a mainstream project? Uh, yeah, in my early, after my first film, after my second film, before they realized I was serious about what I was doing. Um, which is not to criticize the m more mainstream uh, production methods, but uh, yeah, I mean they're always on the lookout for talented new people to come in and help them make the manufactured product that they they do. Um, so they would always, if they see somebody like me who made some tiny little film that got distributed and people liked it, got good reviews, so of course they would come and take me to lunch and uh, 
talk to me about it. But uh, and they were great people. To, but we just didn't have anything in common. I mean, they didn't really. I would have made their lives miserable. You know, really. Have you stopped drawing? Have I stopped drawing? Yeah. Uh, no, I still draw, but it, it's nothing serious. I, mean, I sketch mostly while I'm uh, directing. But it's like, uh, do you do your own storyboards? Something like storyboards. It's a mix of, it's sort of like um, diagrams. And sometimes, mostly when it has to do with action, I'll do some pictures. Um. I, I, is there any of your films that you would choose to erase from your past? No. No, they're all of a continue. You know, they're all continuous. Really, they one leads into the other. What is a short film for you? Uh, first, remind me what short films are we? I'm discussing. Theory, okay, because those are back in the early 90s. Right? Um, short films are a place to uh, experiment technically and, um, and even with s subject matter a little bit. Um, I've always noticed that people have a greater patience with short films, so you can be much more formally experimental. You, you can be weirder <laughs> if you need to. Um, and so I'd work out ideas both in dialogue and, and in making pictures uh, in the short films. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, in Spain at least, uh, there's a theory that a short film is almost like a visit card, like something to prove that you are prepared for shooting a feature film. Do you agree with that concept? Uh, um, I don't know about other filmmakers, but for me, no. Uh, the short films I made before I began to make features did not help me make features at all, <laughs> uh, because they were they were not um, presenting anything that would indicate what a feature would be like if I made one. Uh, I made them as individual pieces of art by themselves, so knowing how long they were, saying 20 minutes or a half an hour, they were what they were. Um, yeah, what helped me make feature films was writing feature-length scripts. But I always wanted to continue making short films, as I, I always do, because um, making a feature usually takes a couple of years to get together. And I need to shoot more than that. I need to shoot each month at least a little so because I need to practice I don't want filmmaking to become theoretical but the way I remember it in the States is uh, it's much easier to get like a commercial distribution of the of short films than here in Spain which normally they would only go to festivals yeah, my um, once I had a career as a feature film director, everybody was offering me small amounts of money to make short films. You know, European television often, uh, American television back in the early 90s. Um, and that was great. I mean, I used to do it with my own money, but then they'd give me a little bit of money to uh, do something because there was so little money they really didn't uh, c care you know they say experiment go ahead uh, because you have a, a reputation now as a quasi famous uh, indie <laughs> something or other uh, you know we can show this on TV and it's a good thing so it was good for everybody I got to work they got to program it uh, now in it's kind of funny that you got a show from go Ambition. You don't look like an ambitious type at all. Uh, Me? I'm terribly ambitious, actually. And that's what ambition was about, actually. Uh, I, w I had achieved a, um, a notoriety without becoming terribly famous. And, and suddenly in New York, I wasn't allowed to shoot. I made very small films, but they got a lot of attention. And the unions 
would not let me shoot in, in the city anymore. And I had written this movie called Surviving Desire, which I wrote for New York City. And I wasn't allowed to, uh, I mean, the, the unions were saying that if you shoot in New York, we'll bother you. So it'll be a difficult thing for you to shoot. So I was like, why are they bugging me? I mean, I'm, I'm not the guy who's going to take work away from their union members. You know, uh, but they said, they were very frank, they said, you are a bad example. Uh, and I was a bad example because I was ambitious, but I was ambitious for making work. I wasn't ambitious for getting rich and famous. But nevertheless, I had become um, a real poster child for uh, independent cinema, and people started to say, well, Hal Hartley is still making non-union films in New York. So it was becoming a problem. <laughs> so uh, when watching Ambition, uh, the spectator could think that uh, you are uh, that character is a how of uh, an alter ego of you. I think no different ones because it, uh, ambition isn't uh, really it's not a fiction you know it's it's like an essay but a lot of those characters that show up in it's only a ten minute long film they show up they say things that come directly out of my notebooks everything everybody says in that come right out of my daily notebooks that the man at the uh, elevator that that's probably as close to me <laughs> says you know whatever he says, but he's complaining that, you know, now that I'm successful, I have to work like five times harder than when I was unsuccessful. So what is my ambition anyway? Uh, in theory of achievement, there's like a motto in the whole film, which is love is a form of knowledge. Did you completely agree with that? I know that's a quote, you know, uh, theory of Achievement, all the lines in Theory yeah. of Achievement are quoted from different places. Um, yeah, generally, probably, yeah. I mean, love isn't just a, an urge. Sex but is an urge, maybe, you know, and eroticism could be a mix of urge and inclin you know, thinking. Uh, but love is a form of knowledge, yeah. Just, I can imagine, just think of this, probably people who, who never I have love, who never have love in their lives, because there's a certain thing about being a human being that they don't know about. In certain points of, the, of, this, uh, of this film, um, it comes as a conclusion for some of the characters, like in the end, what you have got, you gotta think is love is a form of knowledge. Do you yeah. think that could be the last thought of, of theory of achievement? Perhaps. I mean, it sounds right. <laughs> I never really questioned it too much. It sounded correct. That's probably why I wrote it down. Wherever I got it, I don't know where I got it. It might be Rousseau, actually, Jean Jacques Rousseau. Okay. Um, if you want to choose, because uh, as I had, uh, sorry, ha as I have just told you, I'm busy with theory of achievement are the two short films that I'm going to release. But uh, if you want to choose uh, your favorite uh, short films directed by you, which ones would you choose to be released? Besides two, those two. Besides those, well, some of the later ones. I like uh, Kimono very much. And, uh, um, I had a very interesting uh, experience with this one, which is now called uh, Sisters of Mercy, which uh, is footage that I found that back in 1993 or 1994, I, I made, I was commissioned by uh, somebody in New York to make a little piece. And I did it with Parker Posey and Sabrina Lloyd, uh, two young actresses who I, I wanted to work with. And I just, would, this is another reason why I make short films. It always gives me an opportunity to bring in some people I'm interested in, uh, but I need to know more about. So I make some kind of 
low impact project. Uh, and that was a three minute piece that we made. But there was uh, about two hours of footage. And I d rediscovered it again uh, in 2004. So like 10 years later, I found all this footage. And I had just gotten my new laptop with Final Cut Pro. And I was teaching myself Final Cut Pro. And I thought, well, I'll just use all this footage and I'll cut something together. And I, I, for a couple of months, I always had this footage on my computer and was playing around with it. And eventually, I made this piece that um, I really quite like, which is now 16 minutes long, which is totally about these uh, girls trying to do what I'm asking them to do. It, it's really almost a documentary of two actresses um, just trying to work. It's all the, it's all the footage between sorry, the takes. Sorry, trying to work or trying to fulfill the desires of the director? Well, that's what the work is for an actor, is to try to, you know, embody what the director is talking about. But do you think that it does only when they're beginning their career, that afterwards, you know, like with a big star, well, I don't know about big stars. So I mean, I just know about actors, actors, whether they're big sorry. stars or... Well, sorry. Do you see what I mean? Uh, I mean, I, uh, after what, like, you have worked with Isabel Huppert. Mm -hmm. does, he, does he work that way because he's a really big name? Well, no, I probably couldn't have made something like Sisters of Mercy with Isabel. Uh, the time, not that she wouldn't uh, be interested, I mean, I remember Isabel being incredibly uh, um, interested in an experimental person. You could see the work she's done from the mid-90s on. I mean, she really finds the most um, challenging stuff to do. You know? uh, no, but uh, Sisters of Mercy came about much more locally. What was the starting point in your mind for such a composed, structured story? Really? Well, um, at first it wasn't. It was just a, uh, a one half hour or 20 minute long film. My uh, friend and producer on that film, Ted Hope, uh, had recently started his company, Good Machine, with James Seamus. And, uh, they w had been talking to, I believe, HBO about a series of half-hour movies uh, made by weird art directors like myself. <laughs> uh, there were many of us around uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and of course, Ted and James were probably closest to all those kinds of people. So the idea was that Ted and James would uh, organize all of us to make stories. And at when by the time Ted approached me, he said uh, it would have to be something about, uh, believe it probably became Sex in the City ultimately with HBO because I remember them saying it has to be about sex in the city at night. And then it was like sex in the city. And then it was like no sex just in the city, whatever. And it went on and on and on for months, and, and nothing really came of the whole um, project. But in the meantime, I had written this short script, which is the New York ver uh, version of Flirt. And um, the project all fell apart. And then me and my, uh, th the manager of my company, Jerry Brownstein, uh, we decided to finance a sh the short film because I knew I would be making amateur later in the year and we would <laughs> in fact we would be making amateur and editing it uh, on an avid and a computer which in 1992 1993 was a, a new thing so we decided to make this short film anyway uh, with our own money uh, in order to learn the computer and also again for me to get to know some new actors I hadn't worked with before. 
And so on the day we were shooting Flirt New York, we shot for two days. On one of those days, uh, me and Mike Spiller, my cameraman, and Ted, my producer, were, were having lunch and talking about, uh, we had a great time shooting that. And I think we were wondering what we could do with this film. And uh, I suggested that we could probably make a story like this again and again and again because it's so, it's just a situation comedy and in fact it's kind of neutral. We can make the same story with like, you know, say old people. The same script but like with people in their 60s and they're having the same sort of love triangle problem. Well, Ted took that idea and got very excited about it and just kind of at a certain point just went off on his own and tried to raise money uh, on that idea. And eventually it came to be three different uh, cultures, distinct, you know, American, European, Asian. Asian. And then I just kept looking for the widest variety uh, as, as possible. Since you know, New York was, you know, a heterosexual situation and in Europe, in Berlin, we found money to make the film. So I said, well, let's make that a, a homosexual situation. And then when we got to um, Japan, I, I let the whole culture affect us. So it was a really interesting project. And I thought of them as three separate films. We really didn't think of it as a feature so much. Um, each film was completely finished before we made the, and Amateur was made in the middle because mm -hmm. we made New York, then we made Amateur, then we made Berlin, and then we made Japan. Japan. So the whole exercise was sort of to, to take that script and go to a different culture and learn about that culture, uh, that uh, milieu. But the other way, it's like, because uh, obviously New York is like the biggest metropolis ever in the last century and a half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what made you think of Berlin as representative of Europe or Tokyo as representative of Asia? Well, first I just thought of continents, <laughs> you know, North America, Europe, Asia. And then um, yeah, it had to do with money, where the money came from. We yeah, there were people in the, in Germany and in Berlin who uh, there wasn't any other representative city in Germany. To my thinking, you know, sort of like to compare the New York and Tokyo and Munich. No, that wouldn't <laughs> work. New York, Tokyo, Cologne, not really. Has it got, sorry? Has yeah. it got uh, something to do with the wall being there? The wall of the world. The wall? No, it hadn't to do with the wall. And it was after that. No, we no, shut no, no, I know, yeah. but you know, like, uh, because it's been like a huge mm, symbol of... Yeah, no, it wasn't that. It was just, it's a world city. Berlin is a world city. Uh, but it's also distinctly German and European. Have you already visited those places before shooting that? I had been in Berlin uh, at least once, I think, doing publicity. But I didn't really know it. I spent a long time there, like uh, six weeks, eight weeks, I think, before we really started production. Yeah. The casting process for the shooting in the other two cities, was it difficult? Um, it was more difficult in Japan, um, where their manner of, uh, of their business is very different. I found in, in Berlin people made movies pretty much the way we made movies in New York. And I uh, found a casting director and a producer and they introduced me to all these you know, great actors in Berlin and who were interested in working in, in English. Okay. And in Japan the thing was is that uh, the, the hardest thing in Japan was finding Miho because uh, I remember telling Ted, oh, uh, about a year before, I said, if we're doing, you know, flirt and we're going to do it in Tokyo, we have to find the girl who's in Tokyo decadence. The, and uh, so he worked on it and he couldn't really find uh, who that was. And then when we were shooting in Berlin, we were shooting in this uh, living room on Wielandstrasse. Um, we were shooting the, the opening sequence of the, the Berlin section. 
And I remember Ted, uh, whoever's apartment that was, was a film producer. And there were like this stack of, uh, I think, Kaya de Cinema. And he, he came over with a, a volume and he pointed to uh, an advertisement for the, uh, the soon to be released VHS of Tokyo Decadence. And the girl's name was there, Miho Nakaido was written there. So he wrote it down and I wrote it down. And I said, when we go to Tokyo, we have to try to find this girl. Because uh, I thought the film was great, but the, her performance was really one of the most heavy things I'd seen uh, in years back then. But when we got to Tokyo, we uh, had a really hard time finding her. And the production company we were first working with uh, didn't want to uh, be associated with um, Tokyo Decadence. It was sort of like Tokyo Decadence had been such a um, scandal in the Japanese society, I guess. Do you know this film? It's a, it's a great film by Ru Murakami, who's a novelist who made this movie. And it's, it's very sexual. It's pretty explicit. Uh, but what, you know, pretty much what it says about uh, particularly uh, Japanese men and their fantasy lives and stuff is pretty... What was the title again? Sorry. Tokyo Decadence. Tokyo Decadence. Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, Kanayama-san. Hmm? Kanayama-san. Oh, definitely. Kanayama -san. It's a pretty famous film. Um, and so Miho was the star of this film. So uh, we couldn't get anybody to help us find her. And then um, our friend uh, Nogami, who had been like assistant director for and script supervisor for Kurosawa since like before the war, she was like had more energy than anybody we met in Japan. And she was um, she trusted me. She said, if the hi this guy is saying that this girl who's in Tokyo Decadence is the right kind of girl, because I had seen hundreds of girls, but we wanted this one. And uh, she went out and she found this uh, girl, Miho Nakaido, who's now my wife, <laughs> uh, making music for a radio station in Shibuya. Because she wasn't really an actress all the time. She was a dancer, and she had done Tokyo Decadence kind of almost it just came to her. She, she hadn't really pursued it. Uh, and she was great. So what is it? <laughs> Say that. Do you think it's right if one of my conclusions, conclusions after watching Third is that it doesn't matter really how do you express it? Feelings are the same all over the world. Yeah. And uh, particularly that uh, crisis of conscience that happens when people have to make a choice. Whether um, we that's really what it was, you know. That uh, no, sorry, we were, talk uh, we were talking before about the difference between sex or feelings. But in the end, as for me, I think sex is a one way to get uh, to get out our feelings. Yeah, but there's not much decision making in sex. You just feel it. It's an urge. <laughs> you just um, but commitment, and uh, I think that's what flirt really deals with. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody, everybody gets, well, most people get to a, a place in their life where they have to, where they feel like they need to make a commitment to another person. Uh, and yeah, I'm just interested in that dynamic. You know. What and okay, uh, so let's go uh, for the girl for Monday. Okay. Why for Monday? Why from Monday? I don't know. I think I just like the music of the title in English, The Girl from Monday. Um, you know, I grew up with a television show called The Man from Uncle, and, uh, and there's a novel called The Man Who Was Thursday, uh, an English novel. It's about kind of it's sort of a spy thing. It's a code. But there was just something but I... Not, sorry. And it has a, there's a little bit of dialogue in the movie, too, where I think the other girl, uh, Sabrina's character, Cecile, is explaining to the girl from Monday what Monday is, uh, what 
what it means. She says it's the beginning of the week. It's it's a new it's a new start. It's you know so it's a little bit of a metaphor. But they're not like uh, for the working class. Normally Monday it's like a it's got a negative uh, connotation. Like yeah. Another Monday. Yeah. Yeah. No, for me it's the same. I love to go to work. So Monday's exciting. Um, it's funny because in, uh, is it right for me to say that in this film is the one you would you try harder to get into a woman's mind? Hmm. Maybe, yeah. I mean, comparing it to... I mean, I've always liked trying to to express what a woman might be feeling because I know there's this interesting thing that happens when a man is trying to understand a woman and so I never try to disguise that I always write that way and uh, it can often be quite funny uh, but also revealing hopefully both um, yeah, but you say that women are more interesting than men well they're more mysterious for me, yeah, and maybe that might not even be a good thing, you know. <laughs> Because if I were as if I were mysterious to myself, <laughs> more <laughs> mysterious to myself, maybe I'd make a greater effort to understand myself more or something. I don't, you know. But, um, or of course, the age-old problem is that uh, a man could put a woman on a pedestal and treat her as an object you know, because she's mysterious and the mysteriousness is, is interesting in and of itself. And, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of my writing in all of these films, particularly as regards women, is about this. Um. And I think uh, that um, we can find in some of your films is characters challenging to the other. Characters challenging? Uh, being to challenged by another character that comes and makes them win out of them in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, has, it, has it ever happened to you, something of the kind? Well, probably all the time, in, in less sensational ways than in The Girl from Monday, of course. <laughs> uh, in a way, um, I think what you're describing this thing that you know other uh, one person's existence challenges the other person's uh, existence uh, has to do with the, my interest in, in responsibility like you know we're responsible for each other I mean res responsibility doesn't mean anything really self responsibility doesn't really mean anything to me when when I I think of responsibility I'm thinking of a responsibility for someone else. Like I might make an action that I think is my own private concern, but that action may have consequences for other people. And I have to, you know, and we, I really can't get out of that. Um, but and I think that's fascinating. And I think that's what makes us people. It, but in that way, it is related with the story of Henry Fool and this guy coming to get into this place, meeting mm -hmm. the, this guy who supposedly is retarded, but he's the one who takes him to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a way, all of my movies are like that. I mean, I just think that in Girl from Monday, it's most explicit. Uh, uh, it, it's really about that, uh, our responsibility for each other. But in Henry Fool, yes, of course. Henry is, a, is this force that comes into a community where everybody's disconnected. And he, one way or another, he always creates these little problems that forces people to work together, or at least argue. Um, so do you think it is frustrating? Like uh, Henry Ford, he wa he's the one who really wants to be a writer. Then he meets uh, Wim, and he makes him write. And he's the one getting the recognition while mm -hmm. he... Uh, He doesn't even get published his memoirs. 
is that frustrating? Is it uh, in what way could it be uh, rewarding? Uh, I th I just thought it was uh, it had a lot of uh, comic and dramatic potential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that was my idea of Henry, that he would be uh, somebody who can cause other people to act, but he himself had a very hard time acting, doing something, getting something done. Uh, I thought that was, uh, I don't have a particular example of anybody or, or anything from my own personal life to underline that. It's just, it seemed very normal. It, it seemed like something that probably happens a lot in the world. You know, there are certain people who, who can talk a great deal about literature but never write or, uh, or you know, you find people all the time who will tell you everything about what a good film is and what a bad film is, but, you know, they don't make films, uh, which they don't have to make films either. But, uh, but this, I felt, was particularly, sa it was sad and funny at the same time, which I like. So it's rich. This is a guy who claims to have quite large ambitions, but he can't really, he doesn't have the discipline to actually sit down and work. But something curious about Henry is that um, while he provokes this uh, poetry writing in the week after, uh, he seems to be ready all the time to have sex with <laughs> every woman there, I mean, with the mother, with the sister. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, in, what, uh, in what way does it mean that uh, he's ready to give pleasure, or to search for the pleasure of the other? Well, he's an addictive person. He's like, he drinks too much, he smokes too much, he drinks too much coffee, he has too much sex, he's, he doesn't know when to shut up. He's Why would you look at me that way? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's a, he's a type of character. Actually, there's, I think there's a long history of these types of characters in literature and movies. And we love them. They're clowns. Uh, but this is a clown who is, in fact, very erudite. He, he's read a lot of things. He knows a lot of things. And he's a good teacher. Uh, but he's a slob. <laughs> Do you think Dostoevsky was like Henry Ford? Well, it depends. Before Dostoevsky became really conservatively religious, maybe when he was like really a gambler and a drinker, maybe he would have he loved he would have loved Henry. Uh, Henry Ford had never been released before in Spain, and now he's coming on DVD. Are you excited about that? Yeah, I hope people enjoy it. You know, yeah, because you can see Faye Grimm or Henry Ford first. It doesn't really matter that. They're connected, but they're not necessarily sequential. So. Um, what happened in the way for, I don't know, I mean, I, I was about to say all of a sudden, but I don't know the process where it was presumptuous of me. But uh, what made you go back to Henry Fool and work about Faye Grimm character? Well, um, when I wrote Henry Fool, when I was writing Henry Fool in the mid-90s, I knew I was writing part of a story that was much bigger. And so there was always that feeling that it would be a bigger story. Uh, but I chose not to commit to, you know, making in the 90s saying this is going to be a trilogy or something. Uh, but it was always in my mind. And um, so could you say that? Could you say that now? Do you think it could become a trilogy? Yeah, I, it will become a trilogy. It will become a trilogy. It I mean, I'm writing the third part now. Uh, so what about the, the sun? It would be about the sun, yeah. The third part will be about the sun. Um, the son and the father up there. But uh, th what really, after about Three years after Henry Fool was done, uh, I really began putting together ideas for stories. And then I spoke to Parker. I really wanted to make a movie for Parker. Uh, we had known each other and worked together off and on for years, but I had never found uh, the role that was really right for her. And uh, yeah, I just thought she was one of the best actresses I've ever worked with. So I 
my it was a big ambition of mine to make a movie for her that was her from beginning to end top to bottom and and believe it or not i i didn't it didn't occur to me very quickly that it would, should be this character of Faye from Henry Fool. But then I, I started thinking about it, and I called her in 2002, in April of 2002, and I asked her if she would be interested in redoing Faye uh, if I wrote it, because I wasn't going to write it if she didn't want to do it. So she said, yeah. And I started I, If she had said no, would you have... Uh, written the script? If she had I said mean, no. Uh, uh, can you think that you could have done Faye Wing without Parker? No. I wouldn't have had the interest, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you're about to release the film in the Spanish so, uh, theaters. Uh, after try after quite, a, uh, quite a while, because it's been quite a while that you haven't released uh, that the films have not been released in Spain. How do you feel about that? I feel good about that. I'm yeah, I'm happy. Because uh, this is in Spain. Is it a country you like? I like Spain a lot. I've been here about five or six times now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. With Higgin, that's something I feel about your films that I uh, haven't felt that much before. I mean, as for me, it is the most political of your films. Is that correct for you? Um, yeah, although I might say it differently, it's um, sort of a film where there's more politics in it. <laughs> I don't know if the film has a, uh, a, an identifiable politics, like, you know, the difference. Uh, it's not a, a film made as politics. It's, it's a film about people. It's a piece of fiction about people in a world where politics is very uh, much a part of everybody's life. And a large part of the story is Faye trying to um, inform herself or let other people help her learn uh, what the politics are all about. But uh, through Faye, we, um, we again see the contrast of, of different cultures. Like once it comes to Europe, mm -hmm. uh, how different is, is it for you? I mean, the difference. Well, the way the difference between America and Europe. Yeah, I mean, for me, Faye is uh, the representative of a, a certain type of American who's a, a good person, but uninformed about the wide world, and it's uh, we kind of move out into the world with Faye, and we experience the world and, uh, you know, particularly uh, foreign policy of many different countries, and, uh, and just how complex and dangerous the world can be. But do you think that the being uninformed is, uh, how do I put this, uh, something quite common to find in the States? Yeah, I think it's a, a pretty common situation coming out of like uh, why uh, uh, media people are not interested in being more informed well it's uh, mostly media monopoly and uh, an education you know system which kind of um, educates people to not be informed because the more people know this is Chomsky pure Chomsky but uh, you know the the more intelligent people are the harder it is to get them to vote for you okay. and and the more uh, challenging they'll be uh, to the newspapers and the television stations uh, which you know, because they have a vested interest in the people not contesting what they say so uh, they don't really want the people that informed and at the same time looking at it from outside because obviously I'm European um, do you think as well it could be a question of being so self-centered well, yeah, that's uh, being self-centered is a result of being uninformed, because you don't know that there's another. I mean, I find you know most of the Americans I meet are curious about things. When you turn them on to something, you, if you brought them, if you dragged them out of their house and brought them to Hihon, they'd be fascinated. <laughs> you know, but um, it's such a big country and it's such a powerful country, and it's 
it's, it is organized to not really look out at the rest of the world. Uh, so that's why I I wanted to make a character like Faye who would um, who's curious and you know wonder struck about everything. Uh, but uh, she's basically a good person, and uh, you know when all this. You know, there's a lot of fascinating stuff out there in the world, but there's also like a lot of horrifying stuff. And she trusts her instincts. There's an enormous amount of duplicity and lies that she encounters, but uh, ultimately she does what she thinks is the right thing. And I'd like to think that she's like more important than John Wayne in that way. <laughs> and as a last question to for finishing this interview, if you if you have the choice, if you have the chance of um, writing the motto in your tombstone, what would you uh, like it to say? <laughs> uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. To be continued. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank okay. You.